rulers and buildings. Figure 1 shows the first balcony of the Qutub Minar. Qutubuddin Ebuk had this constructed around 1199. Notice the pattern created under the balcony by the small arches and geometrical designs. Can you see two bands of inscriptions under the balcony? These are in Arabic. Notice that the surface of the minar is curved and angular. Placing an inscription on such a surface required great precision. Only the most skilled craftsperson could perform this task. Remember that very few buildings were made of stone or brick 800 years ago. What would have been the impact of a building like the Qutub Minar on observers in the 13th century? Between the 8th and the 18th centuries, kings and their officers built two kinds of structures. The first were forts, palaces, garden residences and tombs. Safe, protected and grandiose places of rest in this world and the next the second were structures meant for public activity including temples, mosques, tanks, wells, caravanserais and bazaars. Kings were expected to care for their subjects and by making structures for their use and comfort, rulers hoped to win their praise. Construction activity was also carried out by others including merchants. They built temples, mosques and wells. However, domestic architecture, large masons, havelis of merchants has survived only from the 18th century. Figure 1. The Qutub Minar is 5 stories high. The band of inscriptions you see are under its first balcony. The first floor was constructed by Qutubuddin Ebuk and the rest by Il Tatmish around 1229. Over the years, it was damaged by lightning and earthquakes and repaired by Alauddin Khalji, Muhammad Tughlaq, Firosha Tughlaq and Ibrahim Lodi. Labor for the Agra Fort Built by Akbar, the Agra Fort required 2,000 stone cutters, 2,000 cement and lime makers, and 8,000 laborers. Engineering Skills and Construction Monuments provide an insight into the technologies used for construction. Take something like a roof for example. We can make this by placing wooden beams or a slab of stone across four walls. But the task becomes difficult if we want to make a large room with an elaborate stupa structure. This requires more sophisticated skills. Superstructure, the part of a building above the ground floor. Between the 7th and 10th centuries, architects started adding more rooms, doors and windows to buildings. Roofs, doors and windows were still made by placing a horizontal beam across two vertical columns a style of architecture called tribute or corbelled. Between the 8th and 13th century, the tribute style was used in the construction of temples, mosques, tombs and in buildings attached to large stepped wells, baulis. Figure 2a Screen in the Kuwait al-Islam Mosque, Delhi, late 12th century. Figure 2b Corbelt technique used in the construction of the screen. Temple construction in the early 11th century. The Kandarya Mahadeva temple dedicated to Shiva was constructed in 999 by the king Dhangadeva of the Chandela dynasty. Figure 3b is the plan of the temple. An ornamented gateway led to an entrance and the main hall, Mahamandapa, where dances were performed. The image of the chief deity was kept in the main shrine, Garbha Griha. This was the place for ritual worship, 
where only the king, his immediate family and priests gathered. The Khajuraho complex contained royal temples where commoners were not allowed entry. The temples were decorated with elaborately carved structures. Figure 4 The Raja Rajeshwara temple at Thanjavur had the tallest shikhara amongst temples of its time. Constructing it was not easy because there were no cranes in those days and the 90-ton stone for the top of the shikhara was too heavy to lift manually. So, the architects built an inclined path to the top of the temple, placed the boulder on rollers and rolled it all the way to the top. The path started more than 4 km away so that it would not be too steep. This was dismantled after the temple was constructed. But the residents of the area remembered the experience of the construction of the temple for a long time. Even now, a village near the temple is called Charupulam, the village of the incline. What differences do you notice between the shikharas of the two temples? Can you make out that the shikhara of the Raja Rajeshwara temple is twice as high as that of the Kandariya Mahadeva? Two technological and stylistic developments are noticeable from the 12th century. One, the weight of the superstructure above the doors and windows was sometimes carried by arches. This architectural form was called arcuate. Compare figures 2a and 2b with figures 5a and 5b. Figure 5a, a true arch. The keystone at the center of the arch transferred the weight of the superstructure to the base of the arch. Figure 5b, true arch, detailed from the Alai Darwaza, early 14th century. Kuwait al-Islam Mosque, Delhi. Second, limestone cement was increasingly used in construction. This was very high quality cement which, when mixed with stone chips, hardened into concrete. This made construction of large structures easier and faster. Take a look at the construction site in figure 6. Describe what the laborers are doing, the tools shown and the means of carrying stones. Figure 6. A painting from the Akbar Nama dated 1590-1595 showing the construction of the water gate at the Agra fort. Building Temples, Mosques and Tanks Temples and mosques were beautifully constructed because they were places of worship. They were also meant to demonstrate the power, wealth and devotion of the patron. Take the example of the Raja Rajeshwara Temple. An inscription mentions that it was built by King Raja Raja Deva for the worship of his god Raja Rajeshwaram. Notice how the names of the ruler and the god are very similar. The king took the god's name because it was suspicious and he wanted to appear like a god. Through the rituals of worship in the temple, one god, Raja Raja Deva, honored another, Raja Rajeshwaram. The largest temples were all constructed by kings. The other, Lesser deities in the temple were gods and goddesses of the allies and subordinates of the ruler. The temple was a miniature model of the world ruled by the king and his allies. As they worshipped their deities together in the royal temples, it seemed as if they brought the just rule of the gods on earth. A royal architect the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan's chronicler declared that the ruler was the architect of the workshop of empire and religion. Muslim sultans and padshahs did not claim to be incarnations of God, but Persian court chronicles describe the sultan as the shadow of God. 
An inscription in the Kuwait Al Islam Mosque explained that God chose Alauddin as a king because he had the qualities of Moses and Solomon, the great lawgivers of the past. The greatest lawgiver and architect was God Himself. He created the world out of chaos and introduced order and symmetry. Figure 7 Plan of the Jami Masjid built by Shah Jahan in his new capital at Shah Jahanabad. 1650-1656 As each new dynasty came to power, kings wanted to emphasize their moral right to be rulers. Constructing places of worship provided rulers with a chance to proclaim their close relationship with God, especially important in an age of rapid political change. Rulers also offered patronage to the learned and pious and tried to transform their capitals and cities into great cultural centers that brought fame to their rule and their realm. It was widely believed that the rule of a just king would be an age of plenty when the heavens would not withhold rain. At the same time, Making precious water available by constructing tanks and reservoirs was highly praised. Sultan il Tatmish won universal respect for constructing a large reservoir just outside Delhi e Kuna. It was called the Hoz e Sultani or the King's Reservoir. Can you find it on map 1 in chapter 3? Rulers often constructed tanks and reservoirs, big and small, for use by ordinary people. Sometimes these tanks and reservoirs were part of a temple, mosque, note the small tank in the Jami Masjid in figure 7, or a Gurudwara, a place of worship and congregation for 6, figure 8. Importance of Water the Persian terms Abad, populated, prosperous and Abadi, flourishing are both derived from the word Ab, meaning water. Figure 8. Harmandar Sahib, Golden Temple, with the Holy Sarovar tank in Amritsar. Why were temples destroyed? Because kings built temples to demonstrate their devotion to God and their power and wealth, it is not surprising that when they attacked one another's kingdoms, they often targeted these buildings. In the early 9th century, when the Pandyan king Sri Mara Sri Vallabha invaded Sri Lanka and defeated the king Sena I 831-851, the Buddhist monk and chronicler Dhamakiti noted, he removed all the valuables. The statue of the Buddha made entirely of gold in the jewel palace and the golden images in the various monasteries, all these he seized. The blow to the pride of the Sinhali's ruler had to be avenged and the next Sinhali's ruler, Sena II, ordered his general to invade Madurai, the capital of the Pandyas. The Buddhist chronicler noted that the expedition made a special effort to find and restore the gold statue of the Buddha. Similarly, in the early 11th century, when the Chola king Rajendra I built a Shiva temple in his capital, he filled it with prized statues seized from defeated rulers. An incomplete list included a sun pedestal from the Chalukyas, a Ganesha statue and several statues of Durga, a Nandi statue from the eastern Chalukyas, an image of Bhairav, a form of Shiva, and Bhairavi from the Kalingas of Orissa, and a Kali statue from the Palas of Bengal. Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni was a contemporary of Rajendra I. During his campaigns in the subcontinent, he also attacked the temples of defeated kings and looted their wealth and idols. Sultan Muhammad was not a very important ruler at that time. 
but by destroying temples, especially the one at Somnath, he tried to win credit as a great hero of Islam. In the political culture of the Middle Ages, most rulers displayed their political might and military success by attacking and looting the places of worship of defeated rulers. In what ways do you think the policies of Rajendravan and Mahmud of Ghazni were a product of their times? How were the actions of the two rulers different? Figure 9. Mughal Chahar Bags A. The Chahar Bag in Humayun's tomb in Delhi, 1562-1571 B. Terrace Chahar Bag at Shalimar Gardens, Kashmir 1620 to 1634. C. The Chahar Bagh adapted as a riverfront garden at Lal Mahal Bari, 1637. Gardens, Tombs and Forts Under the Mughals, architecture became more complex. Babur, Humayun, Akbar, Jahangir, and especially Shah Jahan were personally interested in literature, art, and architecture. In his autobiography, Babur described his interest in planning and laying out formal gardens, placed within rectangular walled enclosures and divided into four quarters by artificial channels. These gardens were called Chahar Bagh, Four Gardens, because of the symmetrical division in two quarters. Beginning with Akbar, some of the most beautiful Chahar Baghs were constructed by Jahangir and Shah Jahan in Kashmir, Agra and Delhi. See Figure 9. There were several important architectural innovations during Akbar's reign. For inspiration, Akbar's architects turned to the tombs of his Central Asian ancestor, Timur. Figure 10. A 1590 painting of Babur, supervising workers laying out a Chahar Bagh in Kabul. Note how the intersecting channels on the path create the characteristic Chahar Bagh design. Figure 11. Tomb of Humayun. Constructed between 1562 and 1571. Can you see the water channels? The central towering doom and the tall gateway, Pishtak, became important aspects of Mughal architecture, first visible in Humayun's tomb. The tomb was placed in the center of a huge formal Chahar Bagh and built in the tradition known as Eight Paradises or Hasht Bihisht, a central hall surrounded by eight rooms. The building was constructed with red sandstone, etched with white marble. It was during Shah Jahan's reign that the different elements of Mughal architecture were fused together in a grand harmonious synthesis. His reign witnessed a huge amount of construction activity, especially in Agra and Delhi. The ceremonial halls of public and private audience, Divan e Khas o Am, were carefully planned. Placed within a large courtyard, these courts were also described as Chihil Sutun or 40 pillared halls. Shah Jahan's audience halls were specially constructed to resemble a mosque. The pedestal on which his throne was placed was frequently described as the Qibla, the direction faced by Muslims at prayer, since everybody faced that direction when court was in session. The idea of the king as a representative of God on earth was suggested by these architectural features. The connection between royal justice and the imperial court was emphasized by Shah Jahan in his newly constructed court in the Red Fort at Delhi. Behind the emperor's throne were a series of Pietra Dura inlays that depicted the legendary Greek god Orpheus playing the lute. It was believed that Orpheus's music could calm ferocious beasts until they coexisted together peaceably. 
द कंस्ट्रक्शन ऑफ शाहजहांस ऑडियंस हॉल एम्ड टू कम्युनिकेट दैट द किंग्स जस्टिस वुड ट्रीट द हाई एंड द लो एज इक्वल्स क्रिएटिंग अ वर्ल्ड वेयर ऑल कुड लिव टुगेदर इन हार्मनी पियत्रा दूरा कलर्ड हार्ड स्टोन्स प्लेस्ड इन डिप्रेशन काफ्ड इन टू मार्बल और सैंडस्टोन क्रिएटिंग ब्यूटिफुल और नेट पैटर्नस In the early years of his reign, Shah Jahan's capital was at Agra, a city where the nobility had constructed their homes on the banks of the river Yamuna. These were set in the midst of formal gardens constructed in the Chahar Bagh format. The Chahar Bagh garden also had a variation that historians describe as the river front garden. In this the dwelling was not located in the middle of the Chahar Bagh but at its edge close to the bank of the river Shah Jahan adopted the river front garden in the layout of the Taj Mahal the grandest architectural accomplishment of his reign Here the white marble mausoleum was placed on a terrace by the edge of the river and the garden was to its south Figure 13 The Taj Mahal at Agra completed in 1643. Figure 14, a reconstruction from a map of the riverfront garden city of Agra. Note how the garden palaces of the nobles are placed on both banks of the Yamuna. The Taj Mahal is on the left. Compare the layout of Agra with Shah Jahan Abad in Delhi in figure 15. Figure 15 1850 map of Shah Jahan Abad where is the emperor's residence the city appears to be very crowded but did you notice the many large gardens as well can you find the main street and the jami masjid Shah Jahan developed this architectural form as a means to control the access that nobles had to the river In the new city of Shah Jahan Abad that he constructed in Delhi the imperial palace commanded the river front only specially favored nobles like his eldest son Dara Shuko were given access to the river all others had to construct their homes in the city away from the river Yamuna region and empire As construction activity increased between the 8th and 18th centuries there was also a considerable sharing of ideas across regions the tradition of one region were adopted by another in vijayanagara for example the elephant stables of the rulers were strongly influenced by the style of architecture found in the adjoining sultanates of bijapur and golconda see chapter 6 In Vrindavan near Mathura temples were constructed in architectural styles that were very similar to the Mughal palaces in Fatehpur Sikri Figure 16 Interior of Temple of Govind Deva in Vrindavan 1590 The temple was constructed out of red sandstone Notice the two out of four intersecting arches that made the high ceiling roof This style of architecture is from northeast Iran, Khurasan, and was used in Fatehpur Sikri. The creation of large empires that brought different regions under their rule helped in this cross fertilization of architectural forms and architectural styles. Mughal rulers were particularly skilled in adapting regional architectural styles in the construction of their own buildings. In Bengal for example, the local rulers had developed a roof that was designed to resemble a thatched hut. The Mughals liked this bungalow dome, see figures 11 and 12 in chapter 9, so much that they used it in their architecture. The impact of other regions was also evident. In Akbar's capital at Fatehpur Sikri, many of the buildings show the influence of the architectural styles of Gujarat and Malwa. Even though the authority of the Mughal rulers waned in the 18th century, 
the architectural styles developed under their patronage were constantly used and adapted by other rulers whenever they tried to establish their own kingdoms. Figure 17 Decorated pillars and struts holding the extension of the roof in Jodhpai Palace in Fatehpur Sikri. These follow architectural traditions of the Gujarat region. Elsewhere, churches that touch the skies. From the 12th century onwards, attempts began in France to build churches that were taller and lighter than earlier buildings. This architectural style, known as Gothic, was distinguished by high-pointed arches, the use of stained glass, often painted with scenes drawn from the Bible, and flying buttresses. Tall spires and bell towers, which were visible from a distance, were added to the church. One of the best-known examples of this